Danger Along the Ohio, Chapter 12 While Red Moccasin and the old man talked, Amos watched, observing the harmony between them. They seemed to know each other very well. Red Moccasin's face softened once and smoothed into what could have almost been a smile. Now, more than ever, Amos wished he could understand their language. Was Red Moccasin telling the old man about being pulled from the river? Maybe when the Indians learned about him saving Red Moccasin's life, they'd let the three of them go. Amos edged over and dropped down beside Jonathan. He was relieved to see that Clara was still sleeping. Nothing was as important as getting her well right now. He swung his gaze to the Indians, fearing what they might do, but the men simply ignored their prisoners. One started a fire, <clears throat> while two tied a deer carcass on a tree branch, then set to work gutting and cleaning the animal. What are they going to do with us, Amos? I don't know, but I think they'll probably take us back to their village. Will they hurt us? Jonathan's voice was only a whisper, and he, wasn't sh and he was shaking so hard that Amos laid an arm around his shoulders. Don't go borrowing trouble, Amos told him. They had a chance to hurt me, but they didn't. He remembered his father saying that Indians took white children to replace children they had lost, but now wasn't the time to tell Jonathan that they would probably be adopted into the tribe. I hope they give us some meat when it's cooked, he remarked instead. As soon as the fire burned down a little, the men sliced off pieces of meat and spitted them over the flames. Intent on their tasks, they took little notice of their captives. They had seemed to enjoy the earlier scuffling with Amos, teasing him as a cat teases a mouse, but now food was more important to them. Guessing the old man was their leader, Amos wondered if he had ordered the prisoners to be left alone. Amos stared at the venison, watching puffs of smoke rise from the dripping juices. The tantalizing aroma made his mouth water. The men tore off chunks of meat and crammed them into their mouths, then licked their greasy fingers. Their sounds of satisfaction were almost more than Amos could endure. But he was hesitant to ask them for some, for fear they would refuse him. Amos saw Red Moccasin sitting by the fire, listening to the men talk. Again and again, his watchful gaze swung over to Amos until finally he rose to his feet. Picking up two cooking sticks loaded with meat, he limped over and handed one of them to Amos and the other one to Jonathan. Before Amos could even nod his thanks, the boy had turned his back to the fire. Though the venison was burned black, Amos tore into his portion, wolfing down bites, scarcely chewing them. He didn't even mind that the meat was almost raw in the middle. After days of near starving, it was a feast. As Amos ate, he studied Red Moccasin. Bringing them meat was a gesture of goodwill. Was that the Indian trying to repay them for saving his life? Amos wished more than ever they could talk to each other. Then he remembered that they were destined to become members of Red Moccasin's tribe. They'd have to learn the Indian's language in order to get by. He wondered if the day would ever come when he and Red Moccasin might be friends. The Indians seemed in no hurry to travel on. They cooked and ate while morning turned into afternoon. Amos noticed the men putting some of the cooked venison in leather pouches and packs. As the day passed, the deer carcass was reduced to a shaggy hide and an antlered head and a pile of discarded bones. When one of the men brought them a second portion of meat in the late afternoon, Amos warned Jonathan, don't eat it all now, save some for later. He wrapped the remains of his piece in, a sev in several green leaves. I'm still hungry, Jonathan said, stuffing another chunk into his mouth. You'll be hungry tomorrow too, Amos said. Amos felt a tingle of fear when the old man in red moccasin came over and stood looking down at Clara. Amos tried to read the old man's face, but the cold black eyes were as impenetrable as frosted window panes. An awful thought flashed into his mind. If Clara was unable to walk, the Indians might decide to take him and Jonathan and leave her behind. When the old man in red moccasin walked away, Amos reached down and felt Clara's forehead. Her skin was still hot and dry. He held a cup of water to her lips, and for a moment her eyes opened and seemed to focus on him. Then they closed again. Sick and weak from lack of food, she'd have no chance to survive alone. 
Amos made up his mind he wouldn't go on without her. If she couldn't walk, he'd carry her, no matter how far it was to the village. By late afternoon, Amos had concluded that the Indians were waiting for someone. He wasn't surprised when four men walked up to the fire at dusk. They squatted there, talking to the others, accepting the cooked meat offered to them. When one of the men turned and looked at Amos, a spark of recognition flashed between them. It was the man Amos had seen at Wheeling, the one who had set the boat adrift, then at the last minute tried to snatch it back. Amos lowered his head to hide his thoughts. The man had attacked Wheeling, shot at his father, maybe even killed him. Maybe all the men here had been involved in the night assault. As the day passed into evening, the Indians let the fire burn low and stretched out among the rocks to sleep. They had no fear of their prisoners escaping, Amos knew, because there was one Indian on guard out beyond the circle of the firelight. Amos had seen him go. Amos milked Queen Anne, and after he and Jonathan drank it, they managed to coax Clara into taking a few sips. Then they raked together a pile of leaves for their bed. Jonathan soon drifted off, but Amos, his back against a rock, gazed into the fire. He thought of the white boy the Shawnee had captured named Blue Jacket. Had he stared into a fire that first night of his captivity and agonized over what would happen to him when he reached the Indian village? Learning to live with the Indians would be hard for them, Amos knew, but especially for Clara. She believed all Indians were savages, vicious and cruel. Amos wondered if living with them would change her mind. Despite his worries, he began to relax and grow drowsy. There was a softness to the light and a stillness, except for an owl screeching now and then in the distance. Amos was nodding and nearly asleep when he heard a noise. He looked up and saw the old man coming toward him. He waited, his heart thumping in his chest. The other Indians might tease him and steal his possessions, but this man would decide his fate. Standing motionless between Amos and the fire, the man's features were a dark blur. His low-pitched voice startled Amos. You, lift boy, from river. Amos jerked upright when he realized he understood the words. You speak English, he blurted out. The old man took a step nearer. White man, come to live in village. I teach him Shawnee, he teach me English. So they were Shawnee, Amos thought. Not that it mattered much. He and Clara and Jonathan were prisoners just the same. Why white boy lift Indian from river? Amos breathed out a long sigh. The man did not appear to be threatening him or trying to quarrel. He seemed almost curious. Red Moxon must have told him about being saved from drowning. If he knows we saved the boy and doctored his wound, Amos thought, it might make a difference. He might let us go. With mounting hope, he spoke to the waiting Indian. I couldn't let him drown. White man kills Indian. The statement was simple and an undeniable fact, Amos thought, but it sounded so, so hopeless. The old man must think all white men were killers, just as Clara thought all Indians were savages. Amos had no reply. The old man sat down near Amos and crossed his legs and folded his arms over his chest. In the fire's glow, his half-closed eyes were slits of reflected light. Just when Amos was beginning to think the man had gone to sleep, he pointed a crooked finger at Red Moccasin sleeping by the fire. He is son of my son. He is the last. The old man's words seemed to hang there in the darkness until Amos untangled their meaning. The man was Red Moccasin's grandfather. That explained their familiar, familiarity and the easiness between them. Amos gazed at the boy sleeping on his side as Jonathan often slept, one hand cradling his cheek, the other one tucked between his knees. Though he hadn't shown it, the boy must been, have been happy to see his grandfather. But Amos didn't understand about Red Moccasin being the last. Was he the last grandson, the last living child in the family, in the tribe? Amos took a deep breath and asked the question, What do you mean Red Moccasin is the last? The old man swung around to peer at Amos in the dim light. He grunted, then asked a question in return. Who is Red Moccasin? 
Expelling a noisy breath, Amos pointed at the Indian boy. We can't say his name, so we call him Red Moccasin. The old man sat, silent, a long time. He turned toward Amos once and seemed about to speak, but then looked back at the fire, his face stern and closed, his voice almost a whisper when he did finally speak again. In season of ripe corn, white man kill the boy's father, mother, sisters. He run, he hide, but he sees it happen. He mourns many moons, then he learns to hate. The tale told in a few blunt words left Amos speechless. The boy had been forced to watch while white men killed his family. No wonder he looked on Amos and Clara and Jonathan as enemies. And in addition to losing everyone, he probably felt guilty because he had been unable to help them. The old man continued, his voice measured and low, vibrating in the darkness like the bass notes of a bullfrog. He lost family. I lost family. Now we only ones left. His slitted eyes narrowed even more. We cross river to hunt in land called Kaintuck. White man attack. We run, but we lose boy. We look for him many days. The man's gaze came back across to Amos. You lift boy from river. You not hate Indians. It was a quiet declaration. It was qu- a quiet declaration. Yet Amos sensed the unspoken question. The man must have witnessed many deadly struggles between the white settlers and his own people, and Amos guessed he was trying to figure out why a white person would save an Indian's life. He was drowning, Amos said. I couldn't let him drown. Indian is enemy of the white, the man insisted. I never saw him before in my life, Amos said. How could he be my enemy? The old man seemed to ponder Amos's question and after studying Amos for some time, he turned to gaze at the dying fire. It came to Amos then that this might be his only opportunity to strike a bargain with the Indian before decisions were made that couldn't be undone. Blue Jacket's contract with the Shawnees had separated him forever from his family, and the same thing might happen to Amos, but he would accept it if Claire and Jonathan were allowed to go free. Leaving them would surely be the hardest thing he ever had to do. He took a deep breath and stated his offer. I'll go with you and won't cause any trouble if you'll let my brother and sister go. The man reply came at once, firm and final. You all go to village, all become Shawnee. Anger sliced through Amos. The old man owed him something for saving Red Moccasin's life, and he was determined to collect that debt. Somehow he knew that once they started for the village, there'd be no trade no turning back. Maybe he could convince the old man he really wanted to live with the Shawnee. It might not be so bad. They could teach him how to live their way, and maybe in time he could forget about his family. My brother and sister won't be happy at your village, but I will, I promise you. I'll learn to be a Shawnee, just like Blue Jacket. Blue Jacket? You know Blue Jacket? The old man's eyes bored into Amos. Well, no, Amos said and hurried on, but I want to go with you. Just let them go. He pointed to where Clara and Jonathan lay sleeping. Why you want to live with Shawnee? Because, because I like Indian ways, Amos said. It was a lame answer, but maybe the old man would believe it. No, you tell true reason why you want to live with Shawnee. Amos searched for an acceptable reply. I want to live free like the Shawnee, he said. Still, the old man waited, silent and unbelieving. Amos dropped his head and squeezed his eyes shut. There was more to this than just the freedom for Clara and Jonathan, he had to admit. He was thinking of himself, hoping to run away from the hurting memory of Simon. But how could he confess all that to the old man? It would be better just to make the Indian believe that he really wanted to be Shawnee. Amos looked up, intending to lie one more time, but the Indian's steady gaze stopped his words. The old man wasn't fooled. Fidgeting, unable to meet those knowing eyes, Amos realized that only the truth would do. Last year, I I killed my best friend. He swallowed hard before continuing. We were playing a game. I pretended to, to shoot him with a gun. I didn't know it was loaded. The old man did not speak, but his gaze never left Amos's face. Amos hurried on. If I, 
I thought if I went someplace where nobody knew me, I could forget about what I had. His voice cracked and trailed away. A frown deepened the wrinkles of the old man's face, and his probing gaze touched Amos like a hot poker. Why had he told the Indian about Simon? He might have been able to live with the Indians without anybody knowing what he had done. Now the man knew, and surely he would tell the others. Well, it was done. But he had to make the old man understand. I've tried to forget, but... The Indian's raised hand commanded silence. He, his stooped shoulders lifted and dropped as he took a deep breath and then pointed at Red Moccasin. My son's son carries the spirits of family. He never lets them go. They are like a great stone on his shoulders. Each day the stone grows, gets bigger, gets heavier. I know all about carrying such a burden, Amos thought. Every day he was reminded of Simon, sometimes of things they had done together, sometimes of a shared thought or feeling but always over all the remembrances was the massive cloud of guilt. Red Moccasin had centered his hate on all white people, trying to erase his guilt. Amos had no one to blame but himself. The old man's voice was soft beside him. I tell boy, the spirits of the dead walk a different trail. You hold them, they will not find trail, must set spirits free. There in the darkness, alone with the old man, the words sounded logical and wise. But how, Amos blurted out, how can a person... The old man's eyes glittered in the firelight. You say to spirit, our trails part. You say to spirit, I walk away. Amos pulled his knees up until they touched his chin. Considering the man's words, they puzzled him. They were so brief, so incomplete, yet they seemed to offer hope. He had carried the sad memories of Simon for so many months he didn't know if he could give them up. Besides, he wasn't sure how a person could lay aside such a burden and simply walk away. He folded his arms across his chest and closed his eyes. He'd have to think on the old man's words, when he was rested, when his mind was not dulled with worry and fatigue and fear. "'You sleep now,' came the Indian's quiet voice. He got up and returned to his seat by the fire." Amos lay back beside Jonathan. An image of Simon appeared in his mind. Not the pain-filled face of the last days, but the laughing face of an earlier, happier time. He couldn't seem to live with the memory of Simon, yet how he, could he live without it? Somewhere nearby, he heard a rustle in the leaves, the scurrying sound of some timid creature who slept in the daylight and scavenged at night. Unlike that creature, Amos longed for the sun. Things always look better in the bright light of day. As he drifted off to sleep, the old man's words whispered inside him like the wind in the tall grass. Walk away. <laughs>